I spin yarn. I spin lots and lots and lots of yarn, and I love it. I found the spinning rabbit hole over a decade ago, and I'm never coming back out. <laughs> but aside from being personally fascinated by spinning yarn, in a lot of ways, spinning yarn it doesn't make any sense. The amount of time it takes to spin and hand knit one sweater means that if I want a new sweater, I have to plan for it months in advance. For example, this is Lily. I purchased her 2022 spring fleece. I scoured it, dyed it, carded it, spun it, and now I'm almost ready to start knitting. She needs one more wash to set the yarn. But I'm coming up on the spring of 2023, so this will be a project that start to finish took a whole year. It will be amazing to wear this sweater when it's finished, but it doesn't seem very practical to wait for a whole year every time I need a new sweater. That kind of timeline means I can supplement my wardrobe with hand knits, but probably not completely build my wardrobe from it. According to Rent the Runway, the average American buys 68 items of clothing each year, and I can produce about one sweater <laughs> per year, which means that if I start now, I will finish my 2022 wardrobe when I'm 100 years old. <laughs> Not practical. Very often, when people ask what I do and I tell them I spin yarn and explain what that means, the follow-up question 99% of the time is, do you sell what you make? People seem confused when I tell them I don't because I explain it takes so much time and work. No one could afford what I would need to charge to make a living. And side note, I'm able to spin full time because I have other ways to earn income by doing this, including Patreon, my shop, and sponsors like Skillshare, today's sponsor. So I'll tell you more about them a little bit later in the video. But first, we are going to dig into all the reasons to spin yarn. And I'm going to spin something while we talk because I need a fidget for my hands, and while I'm fidgeting, anyway, I might as well get something useful from it. Let me show you what I'm spinning today. My friend Connie, who runs English Blue Ribbon Farm with her husband, sent me this box of goodies to spin. I love it when there is a little picture of the sheep included. That is just such a special touch. So what we have here is some Rommeldale CVM, Romney and Alpaca, and she wants me to test this out for her. I know it's going to be wonderful. <laughs> Look at this little sheep. This is the cutest. This is the cutest. What should I name him? I'm going to put this little sheep up on my mantle. <laughs> He's so cute. Look, look at the little detail. It's a little knit sweater. Oh my goodness, I love it so much. So here's the fiber. I know that the CVM is this blue. She said it was dyed with indigo. Oh, I can feel this is the alpaca. And this feels just like Romney. Perfect. Wow. Well, I think, you know... I wanted to start with the CVM, but now that I have this out, I think I might spin the Romney. I'm feeling like the Romney. This is just the most beautiful presentation. I love it. So let's spin some Romney while we chat about spinning. English Blue Ribbon Farm, by the way is the home of Lily the sheep who grew all of this scrumptious fleece that is about to finally become a sweater a year later. <laughs> I have this Romney. It's wrapped up on my uh, little ring distaff. So I'm going to put this on my finger like this. It helps me keep everything managed while I'm spinning so it doesn't fly around everywhere. 
This is a fancy new Nordic spindle that I recently got, but I'm gonna talk more about this in a future video. Stay tuned. While I was planning this video and thinking about why I spin, I tried to remember my initial reasons for picking up that first spindle. My first spindle was that quintessential dowel rod, craft wheel, and cup hook. But my spinning journey really started before that. I think it started with a change in my mindset and my growing awareness of how far removed I was from the source of everything around me. By that I mean I felt a need <laughs> to trace production of the stuff I was using. Was it sustainable? Was it ethical? Where did all my stuff come from? For me, that curiosity really started in the mid-2000s. It started with this book, uh, The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. Did any of you read this? Tell me in the comments. In his book, Pollan follows each of the food chains that sustain us. Industrial food, organic or alternative food, and foraged food. He traces each food along its path from its source to the final meal. At that time, I was connecting with my local community of food producers. They really opened my eyes to how our current food system in the United States is controlled by only a handful of corporations and it's designed to make as much profit as possible while paying farmers as little as possible. The perception of choice in the grocery store is an illusion because just four firms control over half the market for 79% of our groceries. <sighs> Once I started down that rabbit hole, I felt like I was discovering why, in spite of friendships, family, being a mom, having a meaningful career, there was something inside me that felt deeply disconnected. It was like a fundamental longing for something that I just, I couldn't put my finger on. The first time I sat my family down to a meal that came entirely from both our backyard and local farmers we knew and had visited their farms, that meal was so deeply satisfying. I think of that meal as my definition of nourishment. Knowing this, you might assume that I was primed and ready to enjoy my farm to table brunch while wearing a sheep to shawl shawl. But no, not yet. I was knitting and sewing at the time, uh, but somehow it didn't occur to me that I could make my yarn myself. Granted, we lived in Louisiana at the time and there wasn't a huge need for wool sweaters. <laughs> However, I do remember taking my students to a historical Acadian village and we saw a woman there spinning yarn. I recall feeling fascinated as she demonstrated spinning to my students, but I still wasn't making the connection. Cloth is made from yarn. All the cloth around me, around you, curtains, upholstery, bed sheets, kitchen towels, jeans, t-shirts, all of it is made from yarn. But I was still looking at these things as it's just fabric and not seeing the material in it or the journey it took to get to me. I feel like there's a whole cloth pun here somewhere. <laughs> Maybe it was because the reenactor I saw spinning at the Acadian village was in historical garb that made spinning feel removed from something that people would engage in for any modern purpose. You know, food is easier to understand. We step outside and we see things growing. I had a garden. 
I was close to plants. They made sense. When we go to a store, we see a tomato and we think, that came from a tomato plant. Some tomatoes are even marketed as better because they are still attached to their vine. But when I looked at a sweater, I couldn't see the sheep. Were there any sheep? Did the sweater come from a cotton field or from a refinery? Before I was a spinner, the idea of going from a raw material to a finished wearable garment felt really complex and inaccessible. Maybe it does for you too. And maybe that's why you clicked on this video because that's the place where many of us are coming from. It's disconnection. Let's fast forward a few years. My family moved from Louisiana to Wyoming. One day I was feeling antsy. So I decided to have an adventure. I drove for two hours through the Black Hills to a yarn store in Rapid City, South Dakota. And guess what they had there? That's right, a spindle and some wool. It was my first spindle. This isn't my actual first spindle. I gave that one away but it looks exactly like it and it's great for spinning fine silk thread. Now it almost feels like I ended up with that spindle on a whim, but I have a vague memory. <laughs> Maybe it's become my own personal lore. I don't know about making some kind of connection between sourdough bread from scratch and yarn from scratch. It was like I realized if I could make my own food, then surely, I could make my own clothing as well. It was like something in me just clicked. My friend Amanda, who has a YouTube channel called Manda Made It, go check her out, she's awesome, said that the first time she washed a wool fleece, she felt like it unlocked something inside of her, something she didn't know had been hidden away. It just clicked. I completely relate to that feeling. When I started spinning, I got closer to soothing that feeling of discontentedness and disconnection. Spinning yarn in the 21st century isn't practical. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but it is so much more. I asked my Discord community to share with me why they spin yarn and craft with the yarn they spin. I received so many touching responses, so um, I'll tell you about a few of them. Some people, myself included, have learned a yarn craft from their mother or grandmother who is now past. So there's a feeling of closeness to our loved one's memory through the act of crafting and spinning. It's a very human connection. Not unsurprising, yarn crafting is a terrific creative outlet. A common feeling many of us share is the satisfaction of working through technical challenges. It feels good to achieve a sense of mastery and hold a tangible reward for the investment of time and the tenacity it takes to bring a large project to completion. More than a few fiber friends talked about how spinning helps them exist as neurodivergent individuals it's a stim, a fidget, and it's a calming sensory experience. It shuts off the brain chaos for a bit. It's mindful, it's meditative. Lots of people shared that crafting helped them through the global panorama, that when life feels out of control, focusing on yarn, and the act of creating feels incredibly grounding. Spinning has helped people through mental health turmoil, dark times, loss, and grief. Also, there's so much joy in spinning. Spinning has led people to discover community, make new friends, feel connected to other weirdos who also spin yarn. Of course, there are some practical reasons to spin yarn too. 
it allows us to have exactly the yarn we want. We can spin with colors that were never chosen for us from the pile of stuff in Miranda Priestley's office. Something funny? We can create clothes to suit our own fashion tastes and our own aesthetic. We can completely sidestep the fashion industry if we want to or engage with it on our own terms. Suddenly, our wardrobe is no longer filled with the illusion of choice. It becomes the outward expression of our inner creative selves. And since we have now found our way into our fashionable wardrobes, we have to address sustainability for a moment. Many, maybe most, spinners spin wool and other natural fibers like alpaca, flax, cotton. But let's talk about wool for a moment. Wool is superbly sustainable. It's biodegradable and renewable. Temple University researchers have found that managed sheep grazing on an acre of recovering agricultural soil with native plants can sequester up to a ton of carbon per year. Wool is biodegradable, taking only four years or less to decompose, as opposed to polyester, which can take up to 200 years to decompose and sheds microplastics every time it's laundered and certainly does not sequester any carbon. Decomposing wool puts nitrogen, magnesium, and other nutrients back into the soil. The biodegradability of wool is good for the planet and it feels good to choose wool knowing that. But it also makes learning about historical textiles really difficult. In many cases, the only way we can learn about historical fashion is through experimental archaeology. <laughs> so much knowledge has been lost to time, and often archaeologists have to study mineralized scraps to discover what people were wearing at various times throughout history. So, history. Let's talk about the spinning yarn to Reading Women's Work by Elizabeth Wayland Barber Pipeline. If you haven't read it, please do. It's worth the read or listen. Or listen while you spin. I have it on my shelf back there. <laughs> but now buckle up because we are taking a dip into history for a moment. But it circles back to a big reason why I spin. So here we go. Evidence of the earliest woven fabrics made from wild flax dates back 30,000 years. During all those 30,000 years, humans have been developing textile technology. Throughout all that time and development, textiles are fundamental to the human experience. They're inextricably linked to economies, politics, class status, culture, artistic expression, identity. Cloth production and trade is recorded in some of the oldest writing. Clothing is a fundamental need for human survival as shelter for our bodies and it embodies the capacity for creativity and expression. It is Maslow's full pyramid of human things. <laughs> Throughout much of human civilization, of course, not all, but many uh, civilizations and cultures, textile work was gendered. It was women's work. Mothers would teach their daughters and their daughters would teach their daughters. All of this cultural identity wrapped up in cloth passed through the hands of women from generation to generation. But then, about 250 years ago, everything changed. James Hargraves invented a machine that could spin thread, yarn, eight spools at a time, and then more. 
up to 120 spools. That's 120 spinners replaced by one machine. And then Richard Arkwright came along and invented the water-powered water frame and boom, the Industrial Revolution is churning, chugging, <laughs> like a freight train. And it's sustained by gobbling up fossil fuel and cottage industries began to vanish. As spinning machines replaced human spinners, the culmination of 30,000 years of human textile knowledge stopped being passed from mother to daughter. That chain of knowledge was broken nearly everywhere. As a result, something so fundamentally human in creation and expression has now become inaccessible to the vast majority of people. And that's not a bug. That's a feature of this system. As my friend Abby Frankmont says, spinning is our human birthright. Now, obviously, I don't think that everybody needs to run out like every single person needs to run out and get a spindle and sheep because obviously it's an activity some people connect with and enjoy and others don't. But when the fundamental knowledge of what cloth is and how it's made gets removed from our general consciousness, it becomes that much easier to treat clothing as a consumable as something disposable. Wear it twice and toss it. And that's a big problem for a lot of reasons. I recently finished reading this book for the second time. <laughs> and in Braiding Sweetgrass, Robin Wall Kimmerer tells a story about learning to weave a basket. Her teacher, John Pigeon, a member of the renowned Potawatomi Basket Makers, teaches Kimmerer to weave a basket from splints cut from the trunk of a black ash tree. John says, don't ever forget, it's the whole life of that tree you've got piled up there. Later, Kimmer wonders what it would be like to live with the heightened sensitivity to the lives given for ours. She considers the life of a tree in her baskets. And looking around her desk, she writes about seeing the tree in the Kleenex, the oaks in the floor, the grapes in her wine. She considers the glass, who was once sand on the beach washed by waves. And she, th she thanks the sugar for making the long journey to her kitchen. But for the items made of plastic, Kimura writes that she can't muster a reflective moment for the plastic. She says that being mindful in a vast network of hyper-industrialized goods gives her a headache. <laughs> I tried this exercise at my own desk and I had the same feeling of overwhelm, <laughs> sort of like a spiraling feeling. <laughs> when I looked at my computer, my mouse pad, the ot light, my plastic gel pens, Later in Braiding Sweetgrass, after talking about living with gratitude and reciprocity, Kimmerer says, now we need more. We need acts of restoration, not only for polluted waters and degraded lands, but also for our relationship to the world. I tried this ex exercise again, but in my studio. And like Ma Michael Pollan tracing food back to its origins, I can tell you that the sheep who grew the wool in the sweater I'm wearing were named Raven and Pearl. When I finished this sweater, I sent their grower a picture and asked her to tell them thank you from me and give them a few extra scritches and maybe some oats. And when I saw Lily's picture pop up on my Instagram feed, I responded, that's my girl Lily. I showed Connie the work I've done so far on Lily's fleece, and she was so excited to see it. That was when she sent me this box. Gifts and relationships. I look around 
and I can tell you the names of several of the sheep that grew the wool I see around me. I know the berries <laughs> that dyed that wool over there. I know where they grew. That wool <laughs> over there came from a sheep named Mouse. And that wool over there <laughs> came from a sheep named Boots. And when I spin, I finally feel that thing that I was missing. I feel grounded, connected, and, and like maybe in a small, small way that what I'm spinning could be restorative. At the very least, I'm contributing less to the fast fashion industry and wearing clothes that are less damaging to the environment and have less human cost. I feel excited to honor my creative self by choosing styles and colors that sing to me. I'm circumventing the system that was chosen for me and instead choosing something that gives me nourishment even if it's at the slow pace of one sweater a year. And that's why I spin yarn. All of that is why I spin yarn. Why do you spin yarn? I'd love to hear about it. And I'm about to announce my next big hand spinning project and what's coming up for this channel. But I have to circle back to where we started for a moment because unfortunately, I can't make a living only selling my hand spun yarn. The way that I'm able to provide so many spinning tutorials and make full-time content about spinning and make that viable for me and my family is through your support. My patron members and Kofi supporters make <laughs> this happen. Literally, they keep the lights on. And so does support of sponsors like Skillshare. So if you haven't checked out Skillshare yet, then you are missing out on thousands of ad-free online classes. When I started putting this video together to talk about why I spin yarn, I was overwhelmed with all the things I wanted to say. So I turned to Skillshare to brush up on my writing skills by taking a class from author Roxane Gay about crafting personal essays with impact. From taking this class, I felt empowered to get my thoughts in order and share my personal story and hopefully convey my passion for spinning yarn with all of you. New hobbies and crafting can be an amazing source of fun and relaxation and so many of the other things I mentioned earlier in this video. Skillshare offers courses for people looking for new types of projects to work on, so if that's you, if you're feeling inspired, then I encourage you to take a look at what Skillshare has to offer. I have a link for you in the video description below. The first 1,000 people to use that link will get a one month free trial of Skillshare, so you can go and check it out. I truly can't thank you all enough for your support of my work here on this channel, and I know you want to hear about what I'm up to next, if you're still with me. <laughs> Here it is, my next big project. I have to grab it, it's on the floor here. This is an Icelandic fleece. It came from a sheep named Cole, and Cole and I are going on an adventure, and I want you to join us. Subscribe if you haven't yet. <laughs> I'm almost done reading. Oh, this is the video of books. <laughs> I'm almost done reading The Valkyrie's Loom, The Archaeology of Cloth Production and Female Power in the North Atlantic by Michelle Hire Smith. I'm inspired. <laughs> uh, the research Smith has done analyzing Viking Age textiles in order to learn about the work of women in the Norse colonies during the 9th century is what this book is all about. And my goal is to use information from her analysis to recreate a Viking Age apron dress. Cole's fleece is going to help us do that. So I will share this project with you in a series of upcoming videos. 
but because the scope of this project is fairly large, I'm not going to hold myself to a weekly upload schedule. I want to have enough time to do quality research and sampling and things like that. So if you are feeling the need for more Jillian Eve content, including some member exclusive make alongs, behind the scenes updates and live chats with special guests, I encourage you to go check out my Patreon to access all of that. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video where I will be scouring Cole's fleece. So until then, happy spinning!